ვიწყებთ ქვიარ ფორუმის მეორე პანელს და მე ამჯერად მაქვს პატივი რომ წარვადგინო ჩვენი შემდეგი მომხსენებელი რომელიც გახლავთ ბოიან ბილიჩი ის გახლავთ პოლიტიკური სოციოლოგი და ფსიქოლოგი რომელიც მუშაობს პოს იუგოსლავიის სივრცეში LGBT აქტივიზმის LGBT აფირმატიულ ფსიქოთერაპიაზე არა ჰეტეროსექსუალობის და გენდერული ვარიაციის საკითხებზე და ის ამ ეტაპზე არის უნივერსიტეტის ასე თქვათ პროფესორი ბოლონიის უნივერსიტეტში და ასევე ასწავლის ვენის უნივერსიტეტში ა დღეს გველოდება ძალიან საინტერესო მოხსენება და პრინციპში ჩვენს პირველ პანელსაც ეხმიანება და ბევრ საკითხს გვაჩვენებს ამჯერად უბრალოდ სხვა ქვეყნის მაგალითზე და მოხსენების სათაური თქვენ ალბათ ყველა უკვე ნახეთ მაგრამ კიდევ ერთხელ გავაჟღერებ ეს არის წერა და თვით შექმნა ქვიარ ცხოვრებაზე წერის ტკივილი და სიამოვნება ამიტომ მე ყველას გთხოვთ რომ დავსხდეთ უკვე და მოვისმინოთ მოხსენება და შემდგომ უკვე გვექნება შესაძლებლობა დისკუსიის კითხვების დასვის რომელიც შეეხება არა მხოლოდ ამ პანელს ხო და აქ გაკეთებულ მოხსენებას არამედ შეგვიძლია ასევე პარალელები გავაბათ ჩვენ წინა პანელზე და რაღაცნაირად შევკრათ ჩვენი დღევანდელი დღის ქვიარ ფორუმი მოკლედ დროს გადაუცემ სიტყვას ბოიას და პირველიქში დამავიწყა მე თქვა რომ უღმეს მადლობა უნდა გადაუხადო რა თქმა უნდა რომ ჩვენთან ერთად არის და ამ სივრცეს იზიარებს და ფაქტობრივად ის ასევე ესწრებოდა თქვა წინა პანელსაც და შეიძლება ასევე ბოლოს გაგვიზიაროს მისი მოსაზრებები თუ ის რაღაც განცდები რაც გაუჩდა ჩვენი მოსმენის შემდგომ ამიტომ უკვე გავჩერდები და გადაუცემ სიტყვას ბოიას მადლობა Okay, um, thank you very much, Lika, for this uh, generous introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for being here tonight in this strange time that we have been living over the last almost two years. I am, of course, grateful to the Social Justice Center for inviting me, and especially to you, Lika and Anna, for all the effort that has gone into bringing me here so smoothly and efficiently. And uh, thanks, of course, also to the interpreters for doing uh, their crucial job tonight. It is a great source of inspiration for me to, to be in Georgia and spend a few days with you, um, taking part in the festival with which you celebrate queerness and put it both in question and in practice. A queer event is hardly ever an easy undertaking because the threat of violence, as we have also heard tonight, constantly hangs like a sword over queer lives, imbuing us with anxiety and leaving a stamp of danger and fragility on our bodies and our minds. As a survivor of Yugoslavia and a queer person, I am certainly aware of what it means to be under siege, to come under a political fire that wants to impose upon us particular ways of being and thinking with the view of ultimately impoverishing our language, our lives, and our worlds. In this sense, I am honored by the opportunity to speak about my and our collaborative work. And I am grateful for this chance to meet many of you and learn about and support different threads of your engagement, which I know and I have realized tonight even more has been taking place in quite challenging circumstances. So ever since I received the Lika's invitation, uh, I have been thinking about what I could possibly tell you tonight that would be worth crossing almost 3,000 kilometers and spending the resources that you have kindly invested into hosting me here. With this in mind, I have wondered how potential points of convergence among us across our regions and experiences would look like. <clears throat> 
And led by this question, I searched within my work for those themes and concepts that would recognize our differences, but then go beyond them to illuminate what we share or what we could possibly share so that a road opens up for an encounter among us. Because otherwise, what would be the purpose of occasions and gatherings like this one tonight if not to make it possible for us to touch each other? If not to set the stage for a kind of contact that would at least temporarily alleviate our fears and soothe the pains of queer isolation, queer insecurity and loneliness. It is in events like this, um, it is events like this that should broaden our notions of belonging or rather transform our burden of non-belonging. It is exactly here that we hope to experience the other the other that is so persistently in us, in our desires and ways of being, as well as around us. In other words, it is here that we embrace and rejuvenate the beauty of queerness, of difference, and it is from here that we take that beauty more courageously into the world. Every possibility for doing such political work is precious, and I wanted to be here tonight in person, with my body, and with our books that are nothing but an extension of our bodies full of anxiety and desire to defend that very possibility and to help it come true. So my idea would be to share with you a few general reflections about a series of interlinked books on the memory, history, and politics of post-Yugoslav LGBT activisms that have been published by a fluid network of around 50 authors over the last six years at times resembling the most amazing uh, solidaristic collective and at times not. While doing this, I am not interested primarily in presenting the content of the books as such, or even less in empirically substantiating a particular argument. I would rather like to offer an overview of approaches and concerns that have informed our queer sociological, ethnographic, and autobiographical work over the last few years, and that have pushed us forward as engines of collaborative thinking and feeling. And I will be doing this hoping that you will recognize yourselves in at least some of these perspectives and dilemmas that I will mention, so that there is sufficient material for us to construct a crossroads at which we should meet tonight. And from what I have heard so far, there are many points of convergence. The issues that we have been exploring in the books have to do with the fact that the dissolution of Yugoslavia to a large extent coincided with the intensification of non-heterosexual and non-heteronormative politics globally, as well as with the expansion of the European Union and its insistence on the advancement of sexual rights within a human and minority rights frame. So rather than engage directly with the conservative politics of nationalist groups or the church and the revival of religiosity, about which there are already so many accounts, we have mostly focused on narratives and memories that relate to the internal contradictions, internal conflicts within left-leaning activist groups in our space, that went through that unfortunate transition from socialism to capitalism in a particularly violent way. We examine some of the tensions that are inevitable and perhaps even welcome whenever people come together to produce social change. <clears throat> 
but also those practices which sometimes weaken emancipatory efforts from within and make even progressive activists, or at least those that would call themselves progressive, perpetuate similar authoritarian and patriarchal patterns of exclusion which they originally wanted to problematize or destabilize. In this sense, one of the guiding principles of our series is the idea of the Italian sociologist Alberto Melucci that social movements are systems of tension. And it is this conflictuality within activist groups that has been in the center of our sociological interest as we moved from topics concerning feminist anti-war activism to Europeanization and LGBT liberation, intersectionality and intersectional sensitivity within activist groups, to the particularities of lesbian engagement and more recently to the transgender movement and transgender culture in the post-Yugoslav space. In all of the books, we have approached activism primarily as a speaking practice, as an effort to acquire a voice and share a language. International LGBT politics that is under a strong Western, especially US American influence, has frequently been conceptualized in terms of a struggle for visibility, for coming out in public space and being openly non-heterosexual. However, most of the time, coming out is a speech act. And in this regard, speakability and visibility are intertwined, rendering each other possible. In the patriarchal and still quite homophobic environments in which we operate as a collective of authors, the cause of non-heterosexual and non-cis emancipation is often restricted to a small group of mostly capital city-based activists, so that visibility, which is very high and sometimes dangerously high for a small number of people, may become detached from or run fast ahead of speakability. In other words, often under the influence of externally driven, that is to say European Union conditionality policies, LGBT activisms may periodically occupy public space without necessarily increasing the non-heterosexual and non-cis speakability of those they address and want to support. Visibility, which is not accompanied by speakability, is on the one hand a manifestation of patriarchy's capacity to absorb some degree of sexual and gender difference by normalizing and silencing it. But on the other hand, it is also a reflection of an activist community that becomes largely unhinged from its constituency, from those in whose name it speaks. So that a huge, huge gap appears between good laws and everyday lived realities so that strong heteronormative structures are largely left undisrupted. Or there is an impression that progress is fragile and made at an extremely slow pace, while exhaustion, frustration, and burnout become widely present. It is then this need to speak which means the need to live and think and love and have sex in the aftermath and in spite of gruesome violence that has made us come together in these books. We have all, regardless of whether we are more scholars or more activists, entered into sociological or, if you will, into ethnographic writing in these books because we believe following Pierre Bourdieu, that sociology is a therapeutic discipline. It is more than anything a voice-giving practice, a martial art which should help us defend ourselves without attacking.
Rather than being led by any professional concern, we entered into the social sciences because we could not have done otherwise. It would have been a luxury to work on anything else when our communities are so deeply wounded through an eruption of death, hatred, and evil that is inevitably accompanied by ignorance, by deep polarizations, by social ruptures that are extremely hard to bridge as there is a general unwillingness to listen and to learn. Our books show how much we yearn for intimacy, for pleasure and knowledge, and for sociological interventions that would relax and de-essentialize our identifications so that they no longer exhaust the possibilities of who we are, and perhaps more importantly, so that they can no longer serve as triggers for violence. In all of these four volumes, we have been relying on concepts as safety nets, as security blankets, because we are inspired by Gayatri Spivak's idea that theory is a survival strategy. Theory is by no means something reserved for Western, white, middle class, heterosexual cis men in academia, but it is rather a map which we need to construct ourselves if we are to increase our own chances of survival and if we are to navigate and start transforming the suffocating structures of hetero and cis normativity that surround us. The catastrophe of Yugoslavia, that unending sequence of wars that we lived throughout the 1990s, generated so much scholarship. However, the nationalist homogenization that has taken place during and since that decade has only sustained authoritarian and patriarchal legacies that lead to social science research which is predominantly detached from local grassroots politics by being overly academicized, elite-oriented, and heterosis normative in character. Research associated with social aspects of, of sexuality, sexual behaviors, and gender expressions, especially those that cannot be subsumed under a heteronormative and cisnormative canon, is still far away from institutional centers of sociological knowledge production in our region. Such studies thus have to be looked for in alternative, quite small and isolated epistemic communities that operate outside of or are in different ways marginally related to universities and state-funded research institutes. They inevitably count on the financial support of foreign donors and hardly ever really manage to find their way to the official curricular or readership outside of the rather narrow circles within, within which they are produced. All of these factors, along with high levels of homophobia and transphobia, combine to force non-normative groups and especially the intersections of their multiple positionalities to remain under the sociological radar. On the other hand, our tragedy brought many international scholars to our space. All of a sudden, our experience and our lives found themselves in the midst of an academic marketplace in which our losses were repeatedly and never conclusively measured, our identities set in stone, guilt attributed and revoked, so that scholarly merchandise produced in the West on the basis of short fieldwork done in our region could then be sold at high prices and so that careers could be built. Our so promising Yugoslav experiment with socialism that eventually turned into a nightmare became during and after the wars a laboratory of citizenship.
as some put it, a platform for political, economic and social experimentation with so many people coming to supposedly teach us democracy and reconciliation and how to live together. The majority of those who came have hardly ever been sufficiently sensitive to hear the fragile, locally-based vibrations of peace that try to resist the forces of destruction and dispersion. As Svetlana Slapšak, a Serbian-Slovenian scholar, says, there is a certain international shadow, a colonial attitude, which consisted of grabbing, banalizing the hot topics, treating them with sometimes open ignorance and disrespect for local sources, sometimes with arbitrary and shallow or unreliable choice of local data. And on top of all this, this colonial situation was often served and helped to grow by the locals, by the locals ready to display the attitude of the colonized. This is a very serious problem in the region, she says, because the wisdom of the colonized is effective, almost deadly, in restoring conservative values that were imposed as liberation from socialist ideological constraints. So it is with this in mind that we wanted to speak from and offer our own epistemic positions to the pool of analysis to which a number of international scholars, of course among them our friends and colleagues, contributed over the years also with care and dedication. Ever since our first volume, we have been led by the idea that decolonizing efforts are based on cooperation, on the centripetal force of coming together. The centripetal force of coming together in spite of our different positionalities. And that these forces have to be intimately bound with local engagement and local knowledge production, however marginal or silent they may be. Our texts are evidence of our attempts to recognize and counter the oppressive regime of cognitive colonization, which interacts with our fears and insecurities to sometimes overwhelm us in the form of self balkanization We understand this self-balkanization as a racialized system of values and hierarchies that is supposed to keep us in place in which our freedoms and our possibilities to speak are restricted. It is Partially then from this desire to recognize and rebel against self balkanization that we developed an interest in intersectionality as a major concept offered by black feminism. We also realized that there was quite little intersectional consciousness or intersectional sensitivity among LGBT activist groups which we attributed to the fragmentation and professionalization of the activist scene in the post-socialist period. Operating in harsh circumstances characterized by fear, existential uncertainty, poverty, and competition for limited foreign donations, the major part of activist initiatives quickly professionalized making it increasingly difficult to envision forms of engagement that would be outside of the NGO frame. Professionalization and bureaucratization pressures often favored the thin urban layer that already counted on substantial amounts of social and symbolic capital. This led to a rapid division of labor through which organizations, while declaratively prioritizing cooperation over competition, specialized in certain areas, 
for example, women's rights, domestic violence, Roma issues, transitional justice, etc. So that overlaps and intersections of various axes of oppression often slipped through such a fragmentation of the activist field. This activist professionalization process has been to a large extent underpinned by the human rights paradigm, which implicitly legitimizes the existing distributions of wealth, status, and power, and in this sense joins forces with the general absence of issues pertaining to social class and the rising social inequalities after socialism. So by drawing inspiration from the painful legacy of black people's struggles against racial subordination in our volume about intersectionality, but also in other books, we wanted to emphasize tentative parallels between the intellectual groundwork laid by black feminists in theorizing their own multiple oppressions on the one hand, and post-Yugoslav scholars and activists attempts to navigate that complex architecture of power in their own context on the other. The basis of this affinity between the two counter-hegemonic projects are widespread tendencies to treat both people of color and post-Yugoslav and Eastern European people more generally as objects rather than subjects of knowledge. Our space is not perceived and we are not taught to see it as a space of speaking and knowledge production. In this regard, we have been helped by the work of the late Serbian feminist sociologist Marina Blagojevic, who examined insightfully the condition of the so-called semi-peripherality. Located between the center and the periphery, the semi-periphery is a sphere of social hybridity with its own logic, which at once embraces and resists Western explanatory paradigms. It is ambivalent and ambiguous through and through. Reworking and going beyond Wallerstein's world systems analysis on the basis of her academic and of course personal experience in the post-Yugoslav space, Blagojevic argued that the semi-periphery is characterized by the intersection of various oppositions, which may look like a location of a discursive void, instability, chaos, and a lack of structure. Semi-periphery is a paradigmatic space of ambiguity, where one is, as she argues, at the same time white and non-white, European and non-European, post-colonial and non-post-colonial, citizen and non-citizen, gen gender and non-gender. So rather than trying to unproblematically push our region into Western theoretical frameworks, in our critical attitude towards neocolonial practices within the global system of institutionalized social sciences. We have been more interested in the politics of translation and the processes through which non-linear movements of concepts and policies result in unintended and unanticipated assemblages. In this regard, periphery or semi-periphery is never a passive recipient, nor just an authentic depository of knowledge waiting for a Western scholar, but it should rather be seen as a contact zone with its own dynamics, within which cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other.
and provide us with a better insight into contradictions and tensions that are being played out in the so-called center. However, we as queer people have found ourselves over the last two decades with new and relatively unexpected roles within this broad neocolonial Eurocentric framework. While we were yesterday total social outsiders, we are now increasingly seen within the Europeanization process as a measuring stick of progress and democracy. Hence, in the volume on the rainbow way to Europe, we start from the premise that EU membership is pursued as the first foreign policy priority in practically all Eastern European states, leaving the Union, particularly in its poorest regions, without any historically valid alternative. This long and painful EU accession process supplies discursive tools that are employed in LGBT activist struggles for equality. Therefore, this book interrogates the multiple forms and implications of that symbolic link that has developed between non-heterosexual sexualities, LGBT activisms, and Europeanizations. In principle, we argue that this link, this symbolic nexus, elevates certain forms of gay activist engagement and perhaps also non-heterosexuality more generally to the point of being a symbol of modernity, while at the same time relegating practices of intolerance to the LGBT community to the status of non-European primitivist other who is inevitably positioned in the patriarchal past that must be left behind. In other words, the link between Europeanization and queer struggle indeed destabilizes the patriarchal sexual and gender regime, but it also tends to alienate the struggle for non-heteronormative emancipation from the domestic political context. By doing this, such a nexus creates a sphere of privileged voices in which Western embassies and their representatives tend to play particularly important roles in partnership with domestic liberal intellectuals and activists who become empowered to act as key intermediaries between Europe and their local contexts. So, given that we deal with Europe and Europeanists as discourses, of course, we problematize the omnipresent trope of Europeanization as a linear process through which the EU policy procedures are somehow supposed to be smoothly exported and incorporated into the logic of domestic political structures. Rather than see it as a one-way street, we approach Europeanization as a complex, dynamic, and troubled translation process whereby ways of governing are, in the words of my friend and colleague Paul Stubbs, constantly contested and renegotiated. We surely do not treat our space as a clean slate, as a tabula rasa upon which the international community and the EU in cooperation with local actors can simply inscribe procedures, techniques and vocabularies that do not really reflect local needs and conditions. With this in mind, in our book we assume that European Union sexual politics is shaped by the colonial legacy of the major European powers including, for example, the Netherlands, that has been very active in the region in terms of support to pride parades. Power differentials that are embedded in centuries of colonial rule produce axes of distinction and division due to which Eastern Europe is presented as constantly trailing behind its more progressive Western counterpart. <clears throat> 
usually seen as Europe's unruly, homophobic and transphobic other. Eastern Europe, or the Balkans, the post-Yugoslav space, is a site of permanent geopolitical transition. It is in the words of Robert Kulpa, close enough to the Western core to deserve being taken care of, but still way too far to be considered eligible for admission to the first world. We draw upon Kulpa's notion of leveraged pedagogy to capture the hegemonic didactical relation that has developed between the EU and Eastern Europe, which works, as Kulpa says, as a whip and carrot, a condemnation and also a promise of redemption. In this regard, our book hopefully contributes to recent efforts to broaden the homonationalism debate by introducing Eastern Europe into that controversial binary opposition between the West and Islam. Speaking of homonationalism, you can imagine our surprise when halfway through working on our volume about lesbian lives and activisms, we learned that Anna Brnabic, an openly lesbian woman, was appointed prime minister of Serbia. This was yet another turn on that emotional uh, roller coaster of regional queer politics. As Anna Brnabic became the first openly lesbian head of government in Eastern Europe, and the second openly lesbian head of government in the history of the world, after the Prime Minister of Iceland, who was elected in 2009. This in Serbia happened only 16 years after the extremely lesbophobic and homophobic pride parade that had taken place in Belgrade in 2001, and about which we write extensively in these books. So it requires some theoretical work <laughs> to start making sense of the fact that Serbia now, all of a sudden, stands together with Belgium and the Netherlands and Iceland, all of which have had gay prime ministers. Of course, Anna Brnabic's appointment prompted the question, as to whether she could bring about and consolidate practices of intimacy different from those that shape heteronormative social arrangements. What is the extent to which Brnabic, as an unprecedented event in the social history of the region, could contribute to Serbia becoming a less homophobic and less misogynous country? Soon into her mandate, however, it became obvious that rather than being a symbol of emancipatory change, she was an illustration of how rapidly political potential of non-heterosexuality and political potential of lesbianity could capitulate in front of dominant social forms and be co-opted by those who had been for decades the target of feminist critique. The fact that Brnabic could afford, both in spite of the law and literally financially, to have a child in a lesbian partnership is in that regard not so much a temporary privilege that will be rectified through upcoming legal solutions but a reflection of profound structural inequalities embedded in the neoliberal capitalist relations that have firmly been set in place, that have been firmly set in place after decades of devastating privatization accompanied by impoverishment, clientelism, and corruption. That there is now an openly lesbian woman symbolically marking the end of that painful transitional process is less surprising when considering Alan Sears' argument that portions of the gay and to a lesser extent lesbian population have managed to advance 
at a time when most movements seeking change were pushed backwards. Homosexuals able to count on certain amounts of financial and or social capital and ready to enter into homonationalist and homonormative social formations based on coupledom and consumption have made gains in the context in which life has become increasingly uncertain through precarization of the sphere of work, rising levels of racism and populism, as well as a general commodification of social relations leading to ever more pronounced inequalities. This advancement took place, of course, due to the commitment of gay and lesbian activists, but it turned out to be possible almost only in those domains that were most compatible with capitalism, such as coupledom, marriage, certain workplace benefits, and lifestyle. Before concluding, I wanted to perhaps also say that our positions as editors and authors of these volumes are certainly not without contradictions. As scholars and activists who have lived through the disintegration of Yugoslavia, and then in the case of some of us, studied at foreign universities and had a series of precarious and temporary jobs within Western academia, we understand that writing first and foremost in English and publishing with British publishers whose books can hardly be purchased by people in our region is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it draws attention to and solidifies symbolic and financial disparities. It underscores the professional character of our work, and it may to a certain extent distance us from and delegitimize us within the local activist communities whose work we would like to support. By being at least provisionally employed by Western European universities, some of us have had not only a distinctly privileged vantage point from which to observe developments at home and follow the way in which they are sometimes simplified and distorted under the pressure of ignorance, racism, and professional constraints of neoliberal academia. But we have had access to resources and different forms of capital that have enabled us individually and together to form a loose network of friends, colleagues, scholars, activists, and activist scholars that is instrumental if collections of this kind are to be produced. As a collective and representational activity and an arena of power struggles embedded in difficult circumstances in which divergent professional ambitions, existential concerns, personality, idiosyncrasies, and of course multiple egos grapple for domination, activism is imbued with disputes regarding the ownership of activist initiatives and the legitimacy to narrate and intervene in the inevitably fragmented activist histories. Because of this, in the books, we insist on a longer-term ethnographic immersion, which presupposes at least an active interest in, if not a full command of local languages, critical engagement with local knowledge production, a theoretical sensitivity that appreciates ambiguity and hybridity above and beyond Western and normative impositions, methods that tap processes which do not operate solely at elite level, the capacity to recognize the emotional burden and trauma created by decades of armed conflicts, uncertainty, and unpredictability, as well as a responsible policy of translation that allows sociological and anthropological accounts that we produce to be read 
and discussed within the local communities from which they originate. Writing in English perpetuates, but also hopefully opens a crack in the academic and policy mainstream that we want to address, and it may eventually dislocate the normative center by enriching it with analytical frames and empirical corpus that stem from non-Western environments. Finally, queer undertakings are fragile and need to be written down. By documenting activist initiatives, we testify to the fact that they happened and transform them into a legacy which can be transmitted. Our book's archives, in which we have assembled fragments of personal testimonies, documents, leaflets, activist publications, as well as fears, disappointments, hopes, pains, and joys of activist encounters, are evidence that certain things were done, and certain persons, us included, existed. In this regard, our volumes are an exercise in prefigurative politics. Currents of care stream through them and constitute an attempt to enact a political life of equality, reciprocity, and collectivity here and now. This does not mean that the process of working together has always been smooth or enjoyable. To the contrary, we are aware that combining activism and academia is not easy. And we have encountered a lot of tensions and frustrations. Some authors have left us, and some friendships have been broken along the way. But by bringing conceptual concerns in conversation with activist practices, we have surely wanted our books to progress beyond that elitist research on activism and strengthen our commitment to reflexive activist research. As we put queer activist responses to homophobia and transphobia under the magnifying glass of our various analytical approaches, we embrace Donna Haraway's idea that the standpoints of the subjugated are never innocent positions. If queer speakability comes to the world as critique, as an embodied act of resistance to patriarchal silencing, as a promise of transformation, if it is rebellious and turned towards freedom, then it must also be ready to look at itself critically. This academic activist symbiosis brings reality to sometimes overly abstract theoretical inquiries, and more than anything underscores that the LGBT movement as an agent of progressive social change needs to always be asking who is left out of our struggles and for what reason? Perhaps the initiatives that we try to remember and analyze are not important to many people, but to those to whom they matter, they matter in particularly profound, even life-changing ways. As queer activists and scholars, we certainly did not want to let conflict and destruction gain the upper hand. Our objective has rather been to illuminate utopian energies and demonstrate that our activism, however fragile and susceptible to distortion, is more than anything a wish for better times, a wish that reflects the power of feminist agency to recreate and reinvent the world by turning suffering into a source of political change. While we criticize unnecessary fragmentation, rapid activist professionalization, class-related divisions, and authoritarian hierarchies within activist initiatives, <laughs> 
These books hopefully not only supply ideas that could perhaps take activist enterprises in new directions, but they also, I would like to believe, demonstrate the capacity of research and academic cooperation to embody the politics of solidarity that we need in our struggle for emancipation, which we desire for ourselves, and of course, for those who are coming after us. Thank you very much.